Melissa Di Corpo. He is a PhD in experimental psychology. Correct? Experimental psychology and then statistics. Yes. Uh, in, statistics. in statistics. And he's been studying this subject since 1978. Yes, it's a long time. Oh my goodness, a long time. <laughs> Welcome, Melissa. Thanks. Well, uh, what I'm talking about tonight is uh, uh, about the law of syntropy, um, which starts from the studies of two American physicists, Michelson and Murley, who were trying to discover the existence of the ether, but what they did, they didn't uh, find anything that had to do with ether, but they found that the speed of light is constant. That created a paradox in physics because uh, speeds were added up and time was constant. Having uh, the speed of light being a constant didn't allow the light to be added from the, the body that was, was emitting it. So this created a paradox which was solved in 1905 by Einstein with the energy momentum mass equation. This is energy, mass, momentum, and you can see that it's all a second order, a quadratic equation, and to find the solution of energy, you need to use a square root. And as everyone knows, I suppose, square roots always have two solutions, one positive and one negative. In the uh, case of the positive solution, time, which is in the momentum, is positive time, so it moves forward. And we have energy that diverges from a cause in the past. In the case of the negative solution, we have time which moves backward. And we have energy which diverges backward in time. So this equation introduced the concept of causality and retrocausality. In the case of causality, we have a deterministic system. In the, and, and so we can use mathematics. In the case of retrocausality, we have a system which is not yet determined, and we have probability and statistics. Well, Einstein considered retrocausality to be unphysical. So he said, what can I do to remove retrocausality from this equation? And he found a very simple way. He said, physical bodies move at very low speeds compared to the speed of light. So we can consider the momentum equal to zero. When we consider the momentum to be equal to zero, the energy momentum mass equation simplifies, simplifies in the famous E m c square, which is not Einstein's equation because it had been produced in 1819 and many people had worked already on that equation. Einstein omitted saying that when the energy momentum mass equation is simplified, we get also a negative equation, uh, which is minus E equal minus mc squared. Now, everything seemed to be okay until 1924, when uh, Wolf, Wolf and Pauli discovered that uh, particles have a spin, which is very fast and is approximately the speed of light. So in quantum mechanics, it is not allowed, it, it should not be allowed to use the simplified Einstein equation, but the full energy momentum mass equation has to be used in quantum mechanics. Well, in 1925, as a consequence of Pauli discovery, two physicists, Klein and Gordon, produced the first equation which combines special relativity with quantum mechanics and now we have special relativity energy momentum mass and this is quantum mechanics here now we have again the very inconvenient square root with a positive and a negative solution so we have causality and retrocausality we have particles and we have waves so in a way this equation explained in a very straightforward way why we had a dual nature matter because the wave nature was 
the backwarding time uh, uh, solution, while the particle uh, nature of matter was the forward in time causality. But the reaction to this dual solution was very negative. Uh, Heisenberg said, I regard negative solution as learned trash which no one can take seriously. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was really valid, the solution. And what Schrodinger did in 1926, he got the Klein-Gordon equation and he just removed the relativistic part from the Klein-Gordon equation, leaving the wave equation, what is now known as the wave equation of quantum mechanics. Now, the problem of this wave equation is that you don't understand why there is a dual nature, matter and energy. Uh, instead, with the Klein-Gordon equation, it was very clear why there is this dual nature. So, in 1927, Heisenberg and Bohr met in Copenhagen, and they formulated the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanic, mechanics according to which uh, matter propagates as a wave. When it is observed, the wave collapses into a particle. And because uh, the wave collapses into a particle, when we perform an observation, they suggested that consciousness creates reality. The observation is an act of consciousness. So consequently, consciousness is, uh, comes before the creation of reality. Uh, <coughs> now, what Heisenberg and Bohr did had huge ideological implications because this was the uh, Nazi period, period of Germany saying that we can create reality in a way supported the Nazi ideology. And when Schrodinger found these ideological implications of the Copenhagen interpretation, he said, I don't like it, and I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it. So as you can see, in physics, often what you choose is very ideological. And uh, now, uh, the point is this, is that now we are faced with two options. Either we have the collapse of the wave function or we have retrocausality. We can't have both of them. Many people are working now on the idea of retrocausality. One of the main, uh, say, physicists is John Kramer from the Washington State University, and he formulated his transactional interpretation according to which every aspect of reality is a continuous interplay between causality and retrocausality. Feynman, in the 1950s, he formulated, formulated his QAD uh, model according to which the emission of energy when you have a matter and antimatter getting together is not because they annihilate but because you have the particle which changes direction in time. When it changes from forward to backward direction, it emits energy. When it changes from uh, backward to forward uh, direction, it uh, absorbs energy. Roger Penrose uh, rejects the idea of retrocausality, but he says that usually physicists tend to reject as unphysical any solution which contradicts classical causality. Unfortunately, in relativistic particles, both solutions of the equation need to be considered as a possibility. Even a non-physical negative energy has to be considered as a possibility. The reason why the negative solution, the retrocausal solution, is usually rejected is one that it contradicts the cause and effect uh, idea. It introduces another type of causality. And the second reason is that the standard model of physics, of uh, particle physics, is based on the assumption that causes always precedes effects. Now, we are faced with three different hypotheses. 
uh, the Copenhagen interpretation of co uh, quantum mechanics that says that there is the collapse of the wave function and that the collapse of the wave function is a product of consciousness, of observation. Einstein that rejected the ne negative solution and said that the propagation on, of information and causality could not exceed, exceed the speed of light. And a group of other physicists that believe that there is a dual causality, causality and retro causality, uh, which is named by some of them super causality. And on one side we have emitters, on the other side we have absorbers. Now, in 1941, an Italian mathematician, Luigi Fantapier, who most people don't know anything about him, but he was considered a genius in mathematics. At those times, he became full professor in 19, uh, at the age of 27. He was invited by Oppenheimer to become a member of the Institute of Advanced Study. He uh, was a good friend with Enrico Fermi, Einstein, he had worked with Heisenberg. So in a way, he had links with all the different ideas of those times. Well, he said, I'm a mathematician, and I cannot accept that physicists have rejected in a subjective way, with no demonstration, no proof, half of the solutions of the fundamental equations of physics. So he said, I'm a mathematician, I want to see which are the properties of the two solutions. So I started working on them, and I found that the forwarding time solution, where you have causes that precede effects, describes energy which diverges and is governed by the law of entropy. You have dissipation of energy. Whereas the backward in time solution, that for us, that we're moving forward in time, is a converging solution, describes com uh, converging energy, uh, increase in the differentiation, in complexity, structure, order, and when listing all the mathematical properties of the backward in time solution, he said, well, I can see these properties in living beings. <coughs> so it must be real, that solution. So on that side, he said, I can see that in life. On the other side, he said, well, if I see that in life, it means that life is caused by the future. And we are future-oriented system, tending to goals, to attractors, and we're not mechanical systems that are only caused by the past. Now, uh, what Fantapia said might seem magic, saying that the life is caused by the future. But if we get into the equation, we see that this equation, um, sorry, this equation implies three types of uh, time. There is causal time which moves forward in time, and causes precede effect, and entropy prevails. And this is typical of expanding systems, like our expanding universe. In co uh, converging systems, we would have just a symmetrical <coughs> and causal system with effects preceding causes. Uh, entropy would decrease. Syntropy would increase, and this should be typical of, say, black holes or systems which are converging. And we have another type of time, which is the supercausal time, in which diverging and converging forces are uh, balanced. For example, we have it in, at the atomic level, and in, at this level, causality and retrocausality should coexist, and time should be unitary. Past, present, and future should uh, coexist together. Now, do we have any empir empirical evidence? Well, we have many different empirical evidences. One has to do with gravity, because if Fantapie is correct, if converging forces are a consequence of the negative solution, well, gravity should propagate <coughs> at a speed higher than the speed of light. Because when we have the positive solution, the limit is the speed of light. Where we have, when we have the negative solution, the, say, lowest speed is the speed of light. And then you can go on at infinite speed. So we can say, well, we measure the speed of 
propagation of gravity, and we see if it is lower than the speed of light and or higher than the speed of light. And these experiments have been performed by Thomas van Flander, a uh, uh, astronomer which is specialized in celestial mechanics. Well, with light, what you have is that you have a aberration. That means that we see the sun, the light coming from the sun, in a different place from where the sun is now, because it has moved uh, while the sun was arriving to the Earth. Measuring the uh, gravity, the pull of gravity, we have no aberration. The pull of gravity is exactly in the point where we see the sun. And consequently, these kind of experiments say that the speed of propagation of gravity is instantaneous. And consequently, they support the negative solution of the equation. Um, now, according to this model, entropy and syntropy would constantly be interacting. We would have <laughs> expansion and contraction continuously. And that is the reason why Einstein, in the 1930s, suggested his cyclic model of cosmology, according to which we have a big bang and a big crunch. Uh, according to this model, while well, looking at it from the syntropy theory, in a, during the big bang era, time goes forward. In the big crunch period, time moves backward. So at the end, we have a forward in time area, era, a backward in time era, and the universe is still in the same time. But we have an increase in entropy, syntropy, entropy, syntropy, and every phenomenon of uh, the universe would, according to this theory, be pulsating between these two opposite forces. This model was rejected in, the 19, in 1934 by Richard Tolman because he said, well, entropy is a universal law. Uh, if the universe contracts, entropy continues to increase, and uh, so it, it, it cannot work. So the, the, point, the new point that is in, uh, included in this theory is that when we have a converging system, entropy decreases. And uh, this was not, uh, not considered in the 1930s, so the uh, cyclic model of cosmology was rejected. In 1998, it was uh, rejected again because they discovered that uh, supernovas were uh, accelerating, accelerating their distance. There was an expansion of the universe which was accelerating. But if you see at the equation, you can explain this acceleration in the expansion of the universe as a consequence of the fact that the flow of time is decreasing. And this has been uh, uh, published, these results, last June by a Spanish group of researchers that um, have, um, headed by Jose Senovilla. Now, if all this model is true, we need to add to thermodynamics two new principles. Thermodynamics says that energy is a given amount, you cannot create it or destroy it, while the syntropy theory says that energy is one. We don't have a vital energy or a physical energy, it's one, but we can have a diverging tendency, which is that of the law of entropy, and a converging tendency, which is that of the law of syntropy. And entropy goes towards destruction and death. Syntropy goes towards life and uh, converging. Now, the problem of Fantapier was, well, if we have uh, mm, syntropy at the quantum level, but we don't have it at the macro level because we live in a universe which is dominated by the law of entropy. How does syntropy flow from the quantum to the macro level? And in 1925, uh, uh, Pauli discovered in the molecule of water what is known as the hydrogen bond or hydrogen bridge. The hydrogen atom is in a state between the macro and the micro level 
which gives to water very special properties. Water has properties which are just the opposite of other liquids. When it freezes, the uh, solid part doesn't sink down, but it uh, flows, and all the properties are just symmetrical. And so the idea was that water allows the flow of syntropy from the quantum level to the macro level, and that would be the reason why water is so essential for life. Now, do we have ways in psychology to test this uh, theory? And this is what uh, Antonella Vanini, that I have been working together, has done in her PhD. The hypothesis Antonella Vanini was working on is very simple. She said, if life is sustained by syntropy, the system that supports vital functions, such as the autonomic nervous system, must show reactions before uh, stimuli. If we support our vital functions with our autonomic nervous system and we acquire syntropy, syntropy flows backward in time, heart rate and skin conductance should react before stimuli. Well, in scientific literature, literature there are many experiments that show this pre-stimuli reaction of autonomic uh, parameters, but there, is, there was no theory explaining why there should be this autonomic reaction. Uh, Antonella, she performed a series of exper experiments that show that there is a, there is a reaction of, uh, of the person was show, shown with colors like blue, green, red, yellow. Then he was asked to try to guess the color that the computer would have selected in the last phase. Well, we see in the first phase of the experiment reactions of the heart rate according to what the computer will select in the last phase. And the person has no way to know what the computer will select later on. So there is uh, a very strong, uh, not only from a statistical point of view, but also from a quantitative point of view, a very strong reaction in advance of the autonomic parameters of the body. And uh, um, these experiments have been done in many different ways to check if, it, if, it could be, uh, the, if the results could be explained in different ways. Now, the, what we get to is that the autonomic nervous system, in a way, acquires this backward in time energy, which is a converging energy that we feel as a uh, feeling of warmth in this area of the body, but associated also to feelings of well-being because it nourishes the vital functions of the body. Usually the feelings associated to this flow of uh, energy, converging energy, uh, are usually named with the word love. When we have this feeling of well-being and warmth in this area of the body, we call it love. And according to the syntropy theory, when we feel, have these feelings, that means that we're going in the direction of the flow of energy. There is a direction we, uh, the energy comes from, and if we are in that direction, we have these signals. When we go in different directions, when we diverge, we don't have any more this flow of energy we start experiencing emptiness linked to suffering because our uh, vital functions are not, uh, say, uh, they don't get the right amount of syntropy. So on, on a side, we would have love that tells us that the direction is the correct direction. On the other <coughs> side, we would have anxiety and anguish that tell us that we are not on the right track. Consequently, emotions would play a very important role in telling us which is the direction we have to follow. And they would work more or less as a needle of a compass. So uh, if, if we direct ourselves in the right direction, we have these very positive feelings. If we go some other way, we experience feelings that are not positive. Okay. 
Um, then we get to this other point is that we would be continuously in the middle of two or type of information. One coming from the past, which is made of, say, quantitative, objective information, facts that are processed by the brain, and information that instead is not objective, right? it's not based on fact. We feel emotions that um, give us a direction, but we don't know why we have to go that way. Uh, well, the important thing is to be able to balance between these two different kinds of information. And often we can consider free will as a consequence of this work of balancing, because we have to decide constantly if we want to follow our heart, our autonomic nervous system, or we want to follow what our head says. In now, presently, in this moment of history, people tend to follow more the head, and that would be one of the reasons why entropy is increasing so much in this moment uh, of history. But if we go to the opposite direction and we favor only the heart, then we have other kind of problems. The point is being in the balance. And uh, three levels of consciousness come out from this model. One is uh, the free will level, which is linked to the fact that we are always choosing between past and future. The unconscious level, which is the, uh, linked to the autonomic nervous system. And a super conscious level, because there is an attractor, an end point, where, where we are going towards, that in a way, would be characterized by unitary time, and uh, it's something that we can experience in very special time of experiences. And, uh, well, I'll skip this, but um, one last point is that we're constantly faced with an inner reality, which is this syntropic reality, converging reality, and an out reality, which is diverging, and tends to be very uh, big tends to be infinite. When we compare ourselves to this very big reality, we feel to be equal to nothing. And this is uh, what I call the identity conflict. And what people usually do, do is they try to increase the numerator of this equation. They say, well, I feel, I feel equal to nothing. I increase my wealth, popularity, power, meaning, or whatever, and try to give a meaning to my life. But whatever we put at the numerator compared to the universe is always equal to zero. Other people use a different, different strategy and they say, well, if the universe is too big, I reduce my universe and I limit my life to a community. So if I'm part of this community, I, if I'm accepted by it, I have my meaning, and that is why some people get very attached to communities. Another way is just to reject the out world, and, <laughs> and that, this has to do with a lot of pathologies that have to do with, with psychiatrics. And, uh, okay. Now, the aim, according to this theory, the solution, is that when we unite ourselves to the universe, you take universe and universe from both sides, and I find my identity, my meaning. Uh, this I is syntropy, universe is entropy, the inflating part. So in a way, the solution is to uh, balance together, to unite these two different forces, polarities of our reality, and not to say that one is good and the other one is bad. It's not that syntropy is good and entropy is bad. But they must work constantly together. Now, nowadays we usually tend to uh, compare ourselves to the universe and to be in this identity conflict. And this creates duality because we are on a side and the, the rest of the universe is on an another side. When we get to the theorem of love, which is when we unite ourselves to the universe, we get to a non-dual, uh, reality, where entropy and syntropy, uh, that is the point. Energy is one, but there are two tendencies in energy. When we get to this, uh, say, one, oneness of energy that is entropy and 
centrally to get together, then we find ourselves, we experience love, because we can do that through love, and we get in a non-dual reality. Well, Fantapie uh, used to say that working on syntropy, on these equations, uh, he so printed in the great book of nature that Galileo said is written in mathematical characters, the same law of love that is, formed in se that is found in the sacred texts of major religions. And the law of life is not the law of mechanical causes. This is the law of non-life, the law of death, and the law of entropy. The law which dominates life is the law of cooperation towards goals which are always higher. And this is the true, and this is true also for the lowest forms of life. Now, in my opinion, probably the symbol of non-duality should not be <coughs> mc square, but maybe <laughs> minus or minus plus mc square. And uh, <laughs> this is all. And, uh, uh, these are some books that we've put in the Kindle format. Uh, we continue working on them. So once in a while we update. update. There's one basic one, which is the law of, uh, of syntropy. And then you'll see there are many uh, different book books we've put. suggesting that um, the choices that we make influence that. Would it be true that if we are continually making choices from the heart, that that wave function starts well, to uh, I, I, I was talking with a friend, a friend today, and that is a bit my hypothesis, that if this dual manifestation of matter and energy, so if we get the double slit experiment, and we start working with our heart, well, that can influence the pattern of material reality that is around us. And uh, but that has to be experimented and see if it happens. So extrapolate, if you would, what would that look like? Or how would you describe well, uh, that? Uh, in my opinion now, but you know, you have to do experiments about it. That's good, that's it. good. <laughs> uh, the lab, the lab, because it's connected to the future, would increase the wave pattern. And so the interfer interference design would be stronger. Uh, instead, if you move away from love, or the interference design should should decrease. That is, my, I don't know if, if I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> um, any theoretical considerations to what? kinds of energy fields we have in a syntropic, uh, is it like electromagnetic fields? Well, you, you know, uh, really usually like when, you, when we talk in, about fields in physics, we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and in, according to this uh, uh, approach, a field is a backward in time causation. And all fields? Yes, all fields would, would be. So it would just be in some other kind of field, the energy of uh, or, or maybe cause, whenever, cause when, entropy. Or whenever you talk about whenever. a field, you're talking about syntropy. And retrocausation. OK, we have time for just one more question. Um, I know because of time, I think you had a speed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know because of time, you had to speed through some of the slides. Uh, I caught one uh, with uh, Teilhard de Chardin. Yes, well, Teilhard de Chardin, uh, that is very important, but I just omitted. Uh, both Fantapia and Teilhard de Chardin were saying that life is caused by the future. Uh, Teilhard de Chardin was talking about an uh, omega point, and uh, according to this theory, 
uh, well, uh, it doesn't match with Darwinistic theory, this one, but neither with creationism. What it says is that there are attractors in the future towards which we are converging. And it was what uh, Teilhard de Chardin found uh, as a pa paleontologist, is that we don't have these missing links between one species and the other, but we have a, a process of continuous convergence towards uh, end points, which is a totally different perspective from the Darwinistic per per perspective. So in many ways, the syntropy theory really uh, matches very well with the ideas of Teilhard de Chardin. Thank you. I'll give Lucy a wonderful warm hand. Thank you so much.